Major funding for NOVA was provided by this station and other public television stations. Additional funding was provided by the National Science Foundation and the Johnson & Johnson family of companies. After 250 years, scientists may have discovered the secret of the sound of the great violins. Sotheby's, New York City. In front. 21, 2, 3, 4. An auction of fine violins is in progress. 2,500. Oh. Lot number 339, the Healy Stradivari. And $100,000 is bid to start this now at 100. At $100,000 now, 110000 at one hundred and ten thousand dollars, one hundred and twenty thousand. At one hundred and twenty thousand dollars now, at one hundred and thirty, one hundred and forty to the order here, one hundred and fifty. At one hundred and fifty thousand dollars now, at one hundred and fifty, one hundred and sixty, one hundred and seventy, one hundred and eighty. At one hundred and eighty thousand dollars now, at one hundred and eighty. At one hundred and eighty thousand dollars, then the bid is near me and against the room at one hundred and eighty thousand dollars in fair warning. One hundred and eighty thousand dollars. Why should an old Italian violin be so valuable? Joseph Silverstein, concertmaster of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, plays a Guarnari del Gesù. Unfortunately for the modern violinist, we're dealing with uh, a collectible commodity. The violin has become a collectible art object. A violin which is over 200 years old, which has been made by a maker of some reputation, one of the Cremonese makers of, of great reputation, is very valuable as an art object, which of course makes it, gives it a dimension beyond just being something that people play on and make music on. If the violin is in superb condition, also happens to have a very good sound, it's going to have three values. One for the collector as an art object, one for the player because of its tonal potential, and a third for an investor More violins are made today than at any other time in history. This German factory alone makes several thousand a year for students throughout the world. But not all modern violins roll off an assembly line. A master craftsman like Francesco Bizzolotti will spend months making a single violin by hand. He uses only the simple tools and traditional craftsmanship of the Italian violin makers of the 17th and 18th centuries. And he produces just a very few fine instruments a year. Yet even the best modern violins made by masters like Bizzolotti somehow lack the mysterious qualities found in the voices of the great old instruments. The brilliance, the richness, the elusive elegance. Violinist Rosemary Harbison. Well, it's, a lot of it's hearsay, but a lot of it's when you're in a concert hall and a great instrument's being played. The player can sit on a, on a pitch without any vibrato, absolutely stark, and can deliver it in a very direct sense to the audience, and it's, it holds them in a place. It takes them by the throat, so to speak, and they cannot let go of it. And if you take a weaker instrument, it simply does not get over to the audience, nor does it have something of an edge, a cut, 
a side, a personality. There has to be a Hamlet in it someplace along the line. Even if he's playing Mozart, somewhere behind it, there has to be another spirit. The instrument can sound very angelic. It can sound rather devilish. After all, Paganini's, Paganini's Guarnerius del Gesù was supposed to have sounded as if he was in league with the devil himself. Uh, I know I've heard performances by such violinists as Heifetz and Chrysler, Weistrach, where I don't know whether it was an angel that was playing, but certainly the sounds that came out of those instruments did not seem to be something of, of our own world. Even the origins of the violin are a great mystery. This fresco, painted in 1530 in Sorono, Italy, is the earliest record of an instrument that looks very much like a violin. The source of its unique design is unknown. The maker of the first violin is unknown. Among the oldest existing violins are those made during the 1560s by the Italian Andrea Amati. He taught his sons and grandson who continued the Amati tradition of beautiful craftsmanship and acoustic excellence. They lived and worked in Cremona. For 150 years, this little town in the north of Italy was the home of the greatest violin makers in history. Along these streets were the workshops of men whose names are synonymous with the finest stringed instruments the world has ever known. The Amati family, the Ruggieri, Carlo Bergonzi, Guarneri del Gesù, and Antonio Stradivari. This is what Stradivari might have looked like, but there are no authentic portraits of him. Very little is known about the most famous of all violin makers. It is believed that he began as a woodcarver and then became a student of Andrea Amati's grandson, Niccolo. Stradivari's earliest violins follow the Amati design, but he soon began making instruments in his own style. Stradivari changed old patterns and old ideas about the violin. He developed and refined his designs throughout a career that spanned three quarters of a century. He gave the violin its finest form. The work of Stradivari and his fellow craftsmen of Cremona was a triumph. An extraordinary union of craft and art that gave music a powerful new voice. It was the golden age of the violin. of 93, Antonio Stradivari died. And within a few years, all the other great violin makers of Cremona were dead. It seemed that their secrets had died with them, for by the end of the 18th century, the golden age of violin making had come to an end. Stradivari did leave behind some of the forms for his instruments and some of the simple tools of his craft. small metal hand planes for shaping the parts. A gauge to measure thickness. Chisels. Scrapers. Clamps. The tools remain, but the knowledge of how the tools were used so skillfully by Stradivari and other great violin makers still remains a mystery. Joseph Silverstein. Trying to decide what makes this particular violin or a, another violin, a great violin by Guarnerius or by Stradivarius or Guadagnini, why it is a better violin than other violins. If I could figure that out, uh, 
I'd certainly be the possessor of a very valuable secret. The quality of the instruments of Stradivarius and Guarnerius is just so high. The number of their instruments that sound beautiful. Just an incredible talent that they had. So the mystery is really how did they put together instruments that had such incredible acoustical properties. These gentlemen were able to choose woods and shape those woods and graduate the thicknesses of those woods in such a way that they produced this incredible acoustical result. The violin is a small wooden box, usually made of maple and spruce. Many coats of varnish cover the exterior. The shape is traditional. Architecturally, the violin is exquisitely simple. The sides, or ribs, define its characteristic hourglass shape. To these are added the neck and gently arched back. The sound post stands slightly off center, wedged between the top and the back like a column. The top, with its F-shaped holes, is reinforced by a stiff beam called the base bar. Finally are added the bridge, the tailpiece, the fingerboard, and four gut strings. This general shape and these basic parts are the same in every violin. Since the time of Stradivari, many craftsmen have tried to copy the specifications of the great violins, hoping to duplicate their sound. Every part was carefully measured, and every design feature carefully noted, in the hope that the secret of the great makers lay in some blueprint pattern that could be followed. Close examination of many instruments soon revealed the complexity of the task. The violins of each master of the Golden Age have unique design features. Even the size, shape, and position of the openings in the top, called F-holes, is distinctive. These violins share a superior sound quality, yet each one has a voice and personality all its own. Perhaps their sound is influenced by the subtle variations of shape and design. Even Stradivari himself modified the characteristic features of his violins throughout his career. Were these irregularities simply a quirk of craftsmanship? Or was Stradivari altering the design of his instruments to change their tone? The answer is still unknown. Perhaps the secret was in the wood. During the 19th century, popular legend held that the great masters had toured the forests of Lombardy wrapping on trees to find the best sounding spruce for the violin top and the finest maple for its back. Some craftsmen speculated that the great masters had worked with rare imported wood of unknown origin, or that they knew special ways of aging and curing the wood. A simple test suggests the complexity of the problem. These three pieces of maple, cut from the same board, are all the same size and shape. But when vibrated or driven by the same transducer, the left piece responds at 207 cycles per second. The center one at 223. And the right piece vibrates at 255. Wood is not a uniform substance. Acoustical variations of this kind in the wood of a violin could dramatically affect its tone. Did the great violin makers know how to determine the acoustical properties of the wood they selected? Again, it remains a mystery. But perhaps their secret was not in the wood itself, but in the way the wood was treated, the varnish. Other 19th century violin makers spent years trying to duplicate the lost formulas of the great masters. They searched for the right mixture, the perfect consistency, the ideal color. Some said it was the purity of Venetian turpentine. 
others suspected some unique combination of resins or some secret ingredient. Then, in recent years, the search became more sophisticated. Samples of varnish were removed from violins of the Golden Age and subjected to chemical analysis by infrared spectroscopy. The analysis showed that the varnishes of the old violins vary considerably in composition. There was no suggestion of a consistent formula, no revelation of any secret ingredient. The old varnishes were very much like good varnishes of today. Apparently, they did not hold the answer either. The separate elements of the great violins, the shape, wood, and varnish, had refused to reveal their secrets. Craftsmen turned to the combination of elements for clues to the mystery. Jean-Baptiste Villome, a French violin maker of the 19th century, became famous for his meticulous copies of the great violins. Fouillon duplicated not only the overall shape of each instrument, but the variations in thickness of the top and back as well. He tried to match the grain of the wood and even the quality of the varnish. In appearance, Fouillon's copies could hardly be distinguished from the great violins, but in tone and responsiveness, they still could not equal the originals. Then, early in the 20th century, the work of Simone Sacconi systematized the craftsman's approach. In his book, The Secrets of Stradivari, Sacconi attempted to reconstruct the techniques used by the great violin makers of Cremona. Sacconi prepared working diagrams based on the average measurements of many great violins. His maps reveal a strict regularity or symmetry in the violin's design, especially in the thickness of the back. His cross-section diagrams show that the violin back is thickest at the center, tapering off uniformly toward the edges. Overall, the symmetry of the back is striking. Sacconi's analysis and his diagrams have profoundly influenced the violin makers of today. At this school for violin making at Cremona, students are taught techniques influenced by Sacconi's research. Cutting the F holes. Shaping the back. Carving the top. Adjusting the sound post. These apprentices are trying to produce fine violins by reviving the special skills of the great masters. Yet after 250 years of searching, craftsmen have still not solved the mystery of how to make violins as consistently great as those of the Amati, Guarneri del Gesù, and Antonio Stradivari. It's very frustrating for me sometimes working with a student that I know is a very gifted young player, and that student is playing on a violin and has very, very distinct limitations, both in its uh, ability to play loud and soft and in its basic quality of sound. It's very frustrating because you know that that student has the potential to do things interpretively that are very attractive, very beautiful, and yet they are so stymied by the limitations of their instrument that they're not perhaps making the kind of progress that they could make. I, f I find that very frustrating and sometimes it's heartbreaking because you know that the possibility of a student like that getting their hands on a very fine old Italian instrument unless uh, a millionaire maiden aunt passes away and leaves them the money to purchase one, the possibility of it is very limited. And that's why I hope that we will begin to develop modern instruments of a sufficient quality so that 
uh, these young players can have the pleasure of working with an instrument that they will grow with and it will grow with them. of the great violins is in the superior quality of their sound. To make such consistently extraordinary instruments, the Amati, the Guaneri, Stradivari, and others must have understood instinctively how a violin worked and how to control its sound. And that sound begins with a taut string. It is a simple object that moves in a simple way. But the motion of a string is too small to radiate sound effectively. Plucked or bowed, the sound is almost inaudible. The string must be attached to something that will amplify the sound. That is the acoustical function of the violin's box. But now, when the violin is played, the string in the box and even the air inside the box move together in a very complex way. That complex motion produces the voice of a violin. And understanding that motion might solve the mystery of the violin's sound. Maupertuis, a French scientist writing in 1724, suggested that the fibers of wood in a violin moved independently, like the strings of a harp. The complex shape of the violin meant that it had wood fibers of many lengths. He thought that, like the strings of a harp, the violin's many wood fibers were tuned by their length to vibrate at specific frequencies when played. Maupertuis' theory led some to study the shape of the violin and the effects of shape on its sound. The results looked strange and sounded even stranger. But Félix Sava, a 19th century French scientist, questioned the idea that wood fibers moved independently. He took violins apart and studied the way the pieces moved when vibrated or driven. He observed that the top and the back moved as units, what he called plates, not as separate fibers. And he noticed that their motion was not simple, but extremely complex. By the 20th century, electronic devices were used to study this complex motion. The first detailed maps showing the motion of the top and back plates when they were vibrated were published by Hermann Backhaus, a German acoustician. At about the same time, another German scientist, Hermann Meinl, also simulated the effect of playing a violin by electronically driving the plates. He made small changes in their thickness and found that this dramatically affected both the way a violin moved and the way it sounded. Today, in Montclair, New Jersey, violin maker Carlene Hutchins carries on acoustical research and analysis. Here, she scatters flat metal filings over the new back plate of a violin. The plate is carefully balanced over an audio speaker mounted in her workbench. She then locates the specific frequency which she thinks will vibrate or drive the plate in one particular mode or pattern shown by the filings. After years of experimentation, Hutchins has learned to control these patterns of vibration in the unassembled plates. She believes that the patterns indicate the acoustical responsiveness of the parts. Well, my role has been to work with the parts of instruments to see if I could create the fine sounding instruments as a result of what I do to the parts. Now many people have said that's a long cry from a fine instrument to work with the plates, but essentially I feel that what the early violin makers did in the Cremona era, shall we say, was to learn 
how to handle the vibrations in the plates based on the sensitivities of their nervous systems and the way their uh, the feel of the plates, the sound of them, and how they bend and flex in their fingers. And my role has been primarily to try to learn first what they did as best I could from contemporary violin makers and from all the literature I could locate, and then to try to see if we could develop test methods that would give us some information on what they did and how they did it that we could tie down a little more closely. Carling Hutchins is the most recent in the long tradition of craftsmen and scientists who have tried to discover the secret of the violin's sound by analyzing its parts. Here she is testing the acoustics of one of her finished instruments. But like those before her, she has found that studying the unassembled parts has limitations. I don't think we're ever going to find out all of what's involved because when you put the two plates together, there are certain changes that are inevitable because of what's happened to the ribs, to the size of the box, to various other characteristics that make a difference. But uh, I've worked with a good many violin makers, including my own students, and in the last 10 years, we've put together probably 200 instruments, all of them with good sound some of them better than others and that's where i keep looking for what makes that a little bit better if there is any big question as to what made these instruments or what makes the instruments of that period of time so so extraordinary it is how did those makers with the limited scientific knowledge of that period manage to put together an instrument and choose woods that match so well created this instrument which is acoustically still miraculous enough so that the modern scientists, the contemporary scientists, look at them and just wonder at how it is that they work so very well. Jack Fry is a physicist at the University of Wisconsin. He has spent much of his professional career in research centers like Fermi Lab near Chicago studying the behavior of subatomic particles. The work requires hours of concentration to discover a single significant interaction amid thousands of irrelevant traces. But Jack Fry has another interest, music. He is an amateur musician and a violin maker. And for the last 20 years, he has searched for a scientific understanding of how violins work and why some violins sound so much better than others. Fry's search began one evening in 1960 at the home of physics colleague, Wilson Powell. He brought home two violins, a Stradivari and a Galliano, and we started playing, and I suddenly became quite aware of the fact that some of the aspects of playing were related to the quality of the violin, which I had not really been aware of before. So being completely naive and completely ignorant of any of the or most of the folklore and most of the efforts that had been put into the field before i thought it would be fun to try to understand how the violin works fry began tinkering with a few violins of a craftsman in madison wisconsin but he soon realized that he would need many more for the number of experiments he wanted to try making each one from scratch would be too costly and time-consuming. So he ordered inexpensive, unfinished white violins from a factory in Germany. Undeterred by the research of others, Fry proceeded on his own, guided by intuition and untutored curiosity. His early attempts were unconventional. He experimented with varnishes. He cracked the hardened varnish to duplicate the acoustical effects of age and wear. He applied a solution of resin to the inside of one violin and forced the resin into the wood with heat to test its effect on stiffness and sound. He even baked some fiddles 
to dry the wood before applying the varnish. A lot of that time was wasted in terms of sort of getting my brain in shape, uh, of getting some of the ideas and concepts which are non-scientific, which have been repeated so long and have been accepted so well by so many people, that to think of it as just an object which is wood, glue, uh, which moves acoustically, mechanically, uh, and that the way in which it moves, therefore its sound, is nothing more than the description of the forces and the stresses, uh, distributions of mass and so on, which control its motion. So once I became really convinced that that is a valid approach, and that a few simple experiments using that approach seem to have worked in building violins, then, you know, one emotionally becomes more free and you start thinking, well, you know, why not try an experiment? It may work, okay, it's just a wooden box. If it doesn't work, nothing lost, $50, so on. By 1967, Fry had turned from what he called the hocus-pocus of violins to the basic question of how they moved when played and how that motion affects their sound. He concentrated on the graduation of thickness in the top and back. And like the craftsmen and scientists before him, he was impressed by the dramatic changes in sound caused by small changes in the graduations. At first, he was guided by symmetrical maps similar to those of Sacconi. But the violins he made from these diagrams were disappointing. Fry abandoned the published maps and began making alterations on his own. Sometimes his attempts failed completely. More often, they produced ambiguous results. Within a year, Fry had performed several hundred experiments and destroyed more than 60 violins. But alongside his ruined fiddles, an idea began to take shape. He knew that one distinctive characteristic of great violins is their grand and powerful voices. He reasoned that inside these violins, the air must move very efficiently to produce so much good sound. Fry decided to focus on understanding the function of the back and the off-center sound post in moving the air to amplify the sound. He needed a conceptual model to guide his thinking and found it in the action of a trampoline. The flat surface represents the stiff central region of a violin's back. The springs are its thinner, more flexible edges. The tension of the springs is even all around. This trampoline corresponds to a symmetrical violin back. The athlete represents the sound post, transmitting the motion of the strings and driving the back, which responds with broad and uniform movement. But in a violin, the sound post is not in the middle of the back. It is slightly off center. In this position, when the sound post drives the back, forcing it to move, the back wobbles. Its motion is uneven and inefficient. But the springs can be selectively removed to readjust the tension of the edges making the edge away from the sound post more flexible than the edge closer to it. The trampoline now corresponds to a violin back with asymmetrical graduations. And when driven by the sound post, its motion is both broad and uniform. The back moves efficiently. If Fry's thinking is accurate, the symmetrically graduated violin back would tend to move unevenly. This could be corrected by adjusting the edges of the back, which control the motion of the central region. Thinning the edge farthest from the sound post, like removing springs from the trampoline, would make the area more flexible. This slight asymmetry in thickness would allow the back to move efficiently and increase the loudness of the instrument. Fry wondered if the back of a great violin with a powerful voice would be asymmetrically graduated. He called on Leonard Sorkin of the Milwaukee Fine Arts Quartet, who plays a Guarneri del Gesù. Rain's pretty good for a 
Yes. <laughs> but you have to get the magnet inside, too, don't you? Yes, and we'll drop it in. Sorkin was reluctant to subject his valuable instrument to possible damage until Fry explained the ingenious method of measurement. Even this very simple device, which is a postage stamp mm -hmm. measuring scale with a weakened spring, but uh, with a magnet got taped onto the top of it, uh, and another magnet which you could drop on the inside of the violin, and of course, as the magnets come together, they attract. And in fact, if you put a magnet on a board, and put the board on top, uh, it attracts, and the, and the force necessary to separate mm -hmm. the magnets is a function of how thick it is. And so let's drop the magnet inside. Now, I guess maybe what? if we do this. Oh, there it is. And then rather than dropping it drastically, right down the rib. I think it's about where I want it. And so, let's see, is it... Just slightly under four. They measured many points on Sorkin's violin. So let's see if we can get it up. They found that the back of the Guarneri was slightly asymmetrical, just as Fry's conceptual model had suggested. Oh, about consistent with... Later measurements of other great Italian instruments revealed similar asymmetry. Was this asymmetry simply a coincidence, or did it have a measurable influence on the sound of an instrument? To find out, Fry excitedly regraduated the back of one of his violins to make it slightly asymmetrical. The modified instrument was more playable, deeper, and louder. But did the back actually move evenly, as Fry had predicted? In his acoustics lab at the University of Wisconsin, Fry measured the back of his new violin. When driven by a transducer at the sound post position, the violin's back moved both broadly and uniformly. The concept of asymmetry had been confirmed. For Fry, it was a breakthrough. His first real clue to the great mystery of the violin's remarkable motion and its sound. expanded his thinking. He developed a simple model for the violin's extremely complex motion. His theory explains, for the first time, both how a violin works and why. As a vibrating string swings to the right, it rocks the bridge to the right, forcing downward a small part of the top and the sound post and the back. At the same time, most of the top rises because it is linked to the left foot of the bridge by the bass bar. When the string swings to the left, these motions are reversed. The back rises while the top moves downward. As a result of these opposing motions of the top and back, air is driven in and out through the F holes in the top. This bellows-like motion creates sound waves that amplify the lowest bass frequencies of the violin. Fry calls this the breathing mode and believes that it is critical to refining the violin's bass voice. At higher frequencies, the hardwood back is too massive to respond to the vibrations of the strings and is almost motionless. As a result, the sound post too is immobilized. Only the top and its bass bar are free to move. The violin begins to amplify sound in a new way. The action of the bridge drives the top in a teeter-totter-like motion around the sound post. The bass bar acts like a beam, stiffening the top and spreading the rocking action along its length. Fry calls this motion of the top the rocking mode. It guides him in controlling the treble quality of a violin's voice.
At the highest frequencies, not only the back and the sound post, but also the bass bar and most of the top fail to respond to the string's vibration. The significant motion of the violin is confined to the small area of wood between the F holes. Only here is the top light enough to respond to the very high frequency vibrations of the strings. Fry calls the motion of this small region of wood the violin's super tweeter and believes that by adjusting it, he can control the brightness of a violin's voice. So basically, I think of the violin as a box, which indeed has a complicated shape, which indeed is varnished, has a mixture of generally two woods. And I think of it as a box which moves mechanically under the action of forces. And uh, the mechanical oscillation or vibration of that box is the uh, explanation as to why it radiates certain types of sound and certain frequency response. So I consider the box as a a driven system, driven by the string, and how it moves is determined by its mechanical properties, its stiffness, its mass, its moment of inertia, and so on. Even with this strong scientific grasp of the mechanical and acoustical properties of the violin, Fry has only begun to understand the intricate mysteries of the instrument. He continues to make experimental violins from the white boxes. He begins with the varnish. Varnish is an important component of the violin. It is one which, like other things of the violin, doesn't have a simple answer. Varnishes play a critical role in changing the ultimate stiffness of the violin. When I make a violin, I can only correctly graduate it by measuring the stiffness of the combined piece of wood and varnish because I certainly cannot control the impregnation of varnishes in woods to a degree that I could graduate it before varnishing it and have the right variations in stiffness after it's varnished. When the varnish is hard, Fry removes the top of the violin to make adjustments in the box. There we go. He first measures the back with calipers to determine its present thickness in graduations. Lots of wood, too thick. No asymmetry. In fact, asymmetry is such that the back will twist. Then he measures the back of the instrument by ear. The motion of the back can be ascertained by using tap tones. For example, if we tap the back in various points, the sound that is generated differs depending upon where you drive it. For example, so you can decide where this particular back would like to be driven by moving about and listening to the sound. He uses tap tones to find where the back would like to be driven, the acoustical center. It would like to be driven about here somewhere. And now the question is where in regard to the left, right, uh, portion of the back does it like to be driven it's clear it's in the center and uh, furthermore the sound on each side is about the same indicating that the back is probably symmetrical as we know from the measurement of thickness so uh, the problem is uh, where is the back driven and that's determined by the sound post let's indicate that on the violin by making a mark then he marks the sound post position and that's where the back should be driven, while as it wants to be driven here, and listen to the difference. Clearly, it prefers to be driven from the center, and we have to move that point from up there down to there. And one can do that by changing the thickness of the wood, and the problem is to take wood out of this area, and that's where the basic problem lies some out of this area, along here and along there, a little bit out of these two areas with some asymmetry in the amount of wood I take out. And that will then uh, permit the back to be driven from a point which is off-center. Uh, the tools 
that are necessary to do this are probably no different than the tools which uh, the old Italian masters could have used. Uh, I've seen planes just like this in uh, the Museum of Cremona of Stradivari, and there are some uh, scrapers. And those are really the only tools you really need to use in uh, putting in some of the asymmetries in the back. I suspect the asymmetry could be enough, and uh, I'll check it by tap tones. That's encouraging, because as I go up, the tone gets more hollow. As I go down, it gets more hollow. As I go off to the side, it's less intense. both ways, which tells me that I probably have done the graduations roughly correctly anyway, so that the center of the driving point would seem to be there. Uh, I think the biggest difference is the intensity of the sound and the lack of hollowness at the point where uh, the sound post is. It's more hollow in every direction, which tells me that that is probably close to the point where the back should be driven, corresponding to uh, piston-like motion of the back. The back complete, he moves on to the top, first working on the flexibility around the F-holes. Well, the F-holes serve many functions. First of all, it is an opening to the box, which in its effect increases the low frequency components of the violin's voicing. It also isolates a little region around the bridge from the rest of the top so that that region can act as a tweeter, so to speak, uh, independent of the motion of the uh, other parts of the top. So it, 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 its shape, its length, and the angle of tilt of the F-holes are all critical parameters in the uh, production of sound by the top. Then to the bass bar. The base bar structurally is stiff. However, there are several parameters in the base bar, several things about the base bar that are acoustically critical. It's thicker near the center where the bridge is than it is at the edges, and that's because you want to reduce the moment of inertia, the inertial properties of rotation of the base bar because it rocks like a teeter-totter under some frequencies. And if one were to put more weight at the edges, it would be harder to make it rock than if you concentrate the same mass at the center. And its length is critical because the flexure of the top takes place between the end of the bass bar and the edge of the violin. How stiff those springs are, because that segment of wood acts like a spring, how stiff that spring is depends upon how thick the top is but also how long or how big the spacing is between the end of the bass bar and the end of the violin. So you may, for example, want to put the bass bar in and after it is in place, you may want to take off some extra wood at the end if the springs are too stiff. He puts the finished parts of the box together. Later, he will add the tailpiece, pegs, and strings. Now, the acoustical role of the bridge becomes significant. Well, the bridge certainly is a beautiful object, but it's also a critical component of the violin because it is a very complicated filter. The string, because of its acoustical motion, moves in that direction, and in the simplest sense, it rocks in this direction. However, for high frequencies, there are a lot of resonances in the bridge, and uh, it's convenient to think of the bridge as a system of springs. There's a spring, here's a spring. Those are springs. This is a mass. 
This is a spring, this segment there. There is a mass there and there. And this system of springs and masses have a lot of resonances which affect the transmission of sounds of varying frequencies through this system to mechanical motions of the feet of the bridge. One can control the stiffnesses of these springs either by lengthening the spring, taking wood out of that segment, or by making the spring less, have uh, smaller dimensions in that direction, or taking wood out and making the bridge thinner. However, lengthening it uh, reduces the stiffness faster than it reduces the mass, so you, in a sense, have independent controls over the stiffnesses of the springs and the masses, which moves the resonant frequencies about at your will. I think there, there are at least two challenges. One of them is to understand, in scientific basis, how the violin functions. What are the important parameters in the violin which controls its sound? What controls the personality of the instrument? But then comes the more, I think, more interesting problem and the more difficult problem. It involves the, uh, the ability to combine the parameters in such a way to give a voice which involves an aesthetic judgment. That judgment requires the collaboration of the musician who will use the instrument. I would uh, like to uh, made a little brighter, but before I do that... With help from Rosemary Harbison, Fry adjusts and fine-tunes the violin's voice, using his scientific understanding of how it works as a guide. Uh, eventually, it's going to be a combination of sound post and uh, bridge adjustment. Uh, are you making... What, are we brighter now? Is this going to be well, brighter? Well, it should make it a, a little bit more refined and a little more responsive. It's okay, except it's not bright enough. Yeah, it's much nicer. It's much prettier. Okay, and so what I'm going to do is to take a little bit of wood out of the bridge in the high frequency side and then eventually on the low frequency side too. What'd you do to get that radical of change just then? Just then, there was just the sound post so that I made the sound post a little closer to the bridge and that drove the back a little harder. Uh, how long will that last? Is it, well, what, wait a minute. What's, what did you do now? Now it took a little bit of wood off the bridge, so it should be a little brighter. You it feel... Be, it's even, though, to the player. Uh-huh. No? You feel, yes, uh, you feel like there's more there, but it is still a little bit too open, I think. Let me tighten it up some more. thinner yes. in that part. It still is a little vulgar in its sound. By that I mean it is too open and not enough centered and not bright enough. For the sake of the argument, make it very smooth. I'd like to see what you're talking about. I don't quite understand that. It's skating. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Well, let's talk about something else about the instrument. If I give... I think it's a little bit... It will have... Again, I feel like it's not quite as deep as it will be at some point. Okay, that when but I drive that's again it, related to a change in quality with bow pressure. And I would like to change that. It's yours. One it's little... True. One little change. Now I should be able to drive a little harder, right? I would think so. Now we lost some things, right? What happened? Well, now it's uh, darker uh, with bow pressures which are light, but if you start forcing it, you bottom out quicker. Mm. How about it? Yeah. How about a compromise? I'll 
Yeah, yeah it's, it doesn't really, I'm not really getting sound in all of it. Could be slightly deeper, but then we, yes. we're trading off, aren't we? Yes, and I think the basic problem is that the varnish is not hard enough. Okay, fine. Let me go the jacket's going to lie. And letting me drive it, I now have lost movement. Yes, yes. Oh, That's right. Well. The standpoint of pure craftsmanship has been tried for a long time uh, as a solution to producing an acoustically functioning instrument. I think science offers a new viewpoint. It offers a tool for exploring into what the old masters may have been doing. And therefore, I think that that is a potential new approach to the construction of great instruments. This is a challenge. It involves all of the things. It involves the craftsmanship, it involves the science in the understanding, and it involves the, science, the aesthetic judgment of the present time. Those are the challenges. That's my task. That's what I want to do. Major funding for the Great Violin Mystery was provided by a grant from the National Science Foundation. For a transcript of this program, send $3 to NOVA, Box 1000, Boston, Massachusetts, 02118. Please be sure to include the show title. Major funding for NOVA was provided by this station and other public television stations. Additional funding was provided by the National Science Foundation and the Johnson & Johnson family of companies.